Hey, everybody, good to see you here today on the live stream 10 Questions with Tim. I am your host, and it is good to be back. This is that moment, first Thursday of every month at noon, lunchtime. So hopefully you can join us. Maybe you're munching on something right now. Let me know in the chat below what you're munching on if you are. And uh, welcome to 10 Questions with Tim, where um, unlike our 46th president, I actually take your questions. Okay, let's go. Let's get into it right off the bat, right to the content, everybody. Oh, a book. No, no, actually, I, I always say that, but what I mean to say is hello in the chat. Uh, hello, Paul. Hello, Larissa. Tonda. Hi, Tonda. How are you? Uh, Eliezer and Olamid. So glad that you guys are here. Chef Salad sounds good. Wise choice, by the way. Breakfast burrito for Paul. Mmm, not so wise choice, but sounds good nonetheless. Let's get into the question, shall we? Question number one comes to us, and it says this. How do we know if we married whom God intended for us? I was saved at the age of 12, but unfortunately, my walk with the Lord has been up and down. I walked away, but not, but I'm the one lost sheep he always went looking for. So true. Very good. I'm working on changing my life, and my husband is newly saved. So when we got married, I was saved, and he was not. So I guess technically we were unequally yoked. We have not. I'm sorry, we have been having a lot of uh, struggles, mainly related to my adult children. This was not either of our first marriages. Will God restore this marriage or was it never blessed? I know this uh, got very long, so please feel free to edit it down. I also want to be anonymous. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the question. And I would like to say, number one, don't look back. <laughs> look forward. First off, there's so many great things that have happened in your life, and I want to encourage you here. Number one, the Lord is going to keep chasing after you. He is coming after you, the one lost sheep. And and good for you for recognizing it. Good for you that you recognize that it was not you getting your life back together, but it was the Lord wouldn't let you go. This is very biblical language. This is very yes, biblical language oriented around the sovereignty of God concerning our salvation. He knows those who are his. He goes after the lost sheep. So number one, God is not letting you go. That's great. Number two, your husband is newly saved. Wow. Fantastic. Praise God. You know, let's not Let's not negate that by looking back at the fact that you he wasn't saved when you got married and you were maybe just getting your life back together. Uh, so there's two great things. You're coming back to the Lord. He's saving you. Number two, your husband saved, which means the Lord saved him. And so let's look forward. Let's look forward to what God has in store for you guys. I think way many more blessings are before you than whatever curses lie behind you. And let us not fall into this trap of, well, we made a mistake in the past and God can't redeem it in our future. The narrative of the Bible, and I've said this on many, many times on this channel, the narrative of the Bible from Genesis right through Revelation is that God uses what the devil intended for evil for our good. That is the story of Joseph. He was betrayed by his brothers, thrown into a pit, sold into slavery. Uh, then he was um, falsely accused of rape, imprisoned for years. One day, the Lord brings him up to the pro right to the place of prominence in Egypt's palace. He is at the right-hand side of Pharaoh. He has all authority. And he says to his brothers when they come and they bow down and they all begging for forgiveness, he says, what are you worried about? What you meant for evil, the evil that you enacted against me. Okay, so just let me tell you this to this questioner. You may have gotten married to an unbeliever, but you didn't sell anyone into slavery, did you? <laughs> You didn't falsely accuse someone of rape, did you? Uh, you didn't um, try to kill someone, did you? Well, that's what Joseph's brothers did. And if God could redeem all that evil for God's good and ultimate purposes in Joseph's life, and not just in Joseph's life, but in Egypt's life, in Israel's life, and in the nation's life, because what Joseph does is he saves up the bread and the grain so that nobody has to starve, so that people don't have to starve. Well, God can use this, this mistake of getting married to someone who is unbel an unbeliever. Now, he, uh, for, for your good. Now, let's get to this topic of your adult children. Your adult children, I'm assuming that they are your children, not his biological children. And that is always going to be a struggle. And it's never going to be something that, you know, I, I know we like to think that he can mentally and emotionally adopt them. There's always going to be that thing, there, especially because they're adults. They know. You, by the grace of God, have got to learn how to love and forgive each other. You have got to, by the grace of God, learn how to submit to your husband, even though he is not maybe the father of your children. And what is your role in the marriage? First Peter chapter three talks about this. Good works, quiet behavior, 
a soft and kind spirit. These win your husband over. Now that he has been won over, they continue to, um, they continue to massage, if you will, his heart into the grace and the purposes of God. I, I know that in marriage, when it comes to marriage, we all want to look for an out. We should not be looking for outs. We should not be looking for outs. We should be looking for growing. We should be looking for cultivating. Every marriage make, means work. Every marriage means um, sacrifice. Every marriage means compromise. And every marriage means forgiveness. Rick Warren famously says this quote. Every great marriage is gr- made up of two great forgivers because both of them are sinners and you're going to have to forgive each other again and again and again and again. Okay, so don't look for an out. God will restore the marriage. Don't worry about the past, about, oh, it was never blessed. God can redeem what was evil for his good. And I'm praying for God's grace over you and your husband and your children, because this is not an easy situation. It's always easiest when both are the biological parents of the children, because that heartstring is there. There's the biological gene thing there. I mean, I, I get that. That's what my situation is. I'm tremendously blessed in that, but not everybody is. And you need special grace and you need to continue to do what you got to do in the marriage to make sure that you're respecting and submitting to your husband and modeling that for your adult children. And, and I would say this, if they are adult children, I hope that they're not living with you if they can afford to live on their own. I hope that they're not, not going to church and living with you. Uh, I hope that they're not, uh, what I'm saying is I hope you're not treating them as babies anymore. I hope you're not, <laughs> I hope you're not funding rebellion which means here's the deal with my kids. If they stop going to church and they're over 18, they're out. And I've told them that specifically. I've told them that directly. Uh, If they're under 18 and they're not going to church, no phone, no friends, no nothing. If they don't go to church, see, see, we have authority here and we have the the opportunity here to have our house served Lord, but we got to make hard decisions. So when it comes to your adult children, I hope that they're not living with you, not going to church, and they're scorning your belief, your marriage, your, your husband, and then you're, you're kind of like enabling it. Don't do that. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Thank you for the question. To the chat we go. Hi, Crystal. Hi, Deluxe. Hi, Paul. Again, sorry. Hi, Anna Rogue. Hello, Crystal. Hi, Lindita. Hi, Larissa. Hi, Kristen. Hi, Jessica Weaver. Hi, Nancy Watson. Hi, everybody. Let me know in the chat. What are you chomping on for lunch? I'm hungry. I haven't had lunch. So, Thank you for the question. Let's get to question number two. Uh, here it is. Regarding... Oops. Oh, sometimes I really hate keynote, guys. There we go. Regarding people... Oh, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> Okay. Regarding people that are saved, I understand I want to be absent. I understand to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I get that, but what about unsaved people? Where do they go? I believe that they don't go to hell until the white throne judgment, but what about before this? Well, that is um, an interesting conversation to have. It's a great question. So the topic is soul sleep. I think we covered this two 10 questions episodes ago. Soul sleep. Do unbelievers enter into soul sleep? Which means they aren't consciously aware of anything until the resurrection on the last day. Well, first off, you're spot on about saved people, which Paul mentions in Philippians, uh, which Jesus mentioned at, at the cross to the thief who was saved on the cross. And he says, today you will be with me in paradise Paul says, I desire to depart and go with, to be with Christ, which is better by far. He's obviously not talking about there's this soul sleep. Seventh-day Adventists believe in soul sleep. There's a couple other denominations that believe in soul sleep. I don't believe in soul sleep. Uh, there is a awareness of the presence of Jesus upon death. You die as a Christ follower. You are immediately transported into glory. Now, you are transpar- pl- transported into glory spiritually, but you are not transported into glory Physically, your body will be raised to life at the last day. When it comes to unbelievers, got to be honest with you, in my studies, I can go both ways. Got to be honest with you. Okay, Luke 16, the story of Lazarus and the rich man. The rich man goes to hell, Lazarus goes to heaven, or Abraham's bosom, the holding place for the saints before Christ rose from the dead. Uh, There's a lot of theologians that say about that story, that is a... um, pearly gates story. So, so like we say in modern vernacular, oh, when I get to the pearly gates, 
you know, someday I'll see Jesus. And we all know that there's no pearly gates and Peter's not checking us in. That's not in the Bible. So it's a pearly gates illustration that Jesus is using in Luke 16, meaning that there was no actual uh, Abraham's bosom and there was no conscious hell before the resurrection. Some theologians believe that. I remember I was in Bible college when my uh, professor told, told us that he didn't believe that. And the whole class like literally had a nervous breakdown because we are like, what are you talking about? You mean what Jesus is talking about is not actually real? Well, you can go both ways. You can say that Jesus, in all, many of his parables, uh, he used things that didn't exist, but he told a story about them to do what parables were meant to do, to illustrate truth. However, the problem is with the Luke 16 parable of Lazarus and the rich man, you have a man who is named and is the only man in all of Jesus's parables who is named. The poor beggar Lazarus who laid at the gate of the rich man and even the dogs came and licked his sores. Remember that story? So there's a lot of theologians and there's a lot of biblical proof texts that say, wait, no, that that's not that's not a pearly gates kind of like figmented uh, illustration of the afterlife. That is real. There was Abraham's bosom and there was a, a judgment, a fiery place in hell, a waiting place for the dead who were unsaved. So you can go both ways. I wish I could give you a black and white answer here, but here's what I would say, whether or not people are consciously in hell who are unbelievers at the time of death really doesn't matter because even if, uh, take for instance, Judas, who would have, who now would be 2000 years in conscious torment or 2000 years in unconscious torment, right? Because he died 2000 years ago when he committed suicide after portraying the Lord. It really doesn't matter because he has all of eternity to be in conscious torment. Do you understand? And by torment, I mean separation from God, utter darkness. Jesus talks about this weeping, gnashing of teeth, where the worm dies not, where the hell is not, where the fire is not quenched. We don't know exactly what hell was, will look like. We know it will be terrible. And Jesus died and went through hell to make sure that we don't have to go there. So in the large scope of things, eternity, 2000 years to eternity, okay, not a big slice of the pie. So I don't think it's relevant. I don't think it matters. I think what matters more is that we do everything that we can, preach the gospel, serve in our churches, invite people to church, pray for our unbelieving friends, neighbors, coworkers to come and hear the gospel so that they might be saved and they might not go there wherever it is and whenever it is. Can I, can I just make that the point? I think we got to get to what's the biggest, what's the biggest deal here? And the biggest deal is let's get them saved. Amen. Okay, question number three. Why don't Christians follow some of the Jewish laws and traditions like not eating pork or wearing yarmulkes? Also, why don't Jewish people believe Jesus died for our sins? Okay, great question. Thank you for the question. So why don't they follow the Jewish laws and traditions like not? Let's first off deal with not eating pork because pork is part of the dietary laws from Leviticus 11. Um, and this is one of the saddest parts of being Jewish in the world. No bacon, no pork chops, no ham. <laughs> oh, how terrible. Okay, well, we, we eat pork today, and we eat all of, we eat shellfish, we eat lobster, we eat shrimp, which Jews don't eat, because um, Jesus teaches Peter in Acts 10 that those dietary laws came to an end at the finished work of Jesus Christ for Gentiles. So uh, the, 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 the Jewish laws concerning your diet, the, the Jewish diet, I've talked about this on this show, I think. Remember when Daniel is hauled off into Babylon and the one decision that he makes he goes to Babylon School of Sorcery. He aces the classes. He's in the top. He's like the valedictorian of the Babylonian, Babylonian indoctrination program. But the one, non, the one thing he won't compromise on is what to eat. And I talked about this. What we eat shapes who we are. It is an illustration for our spirits. In other words, the word of God is likened unto bread. So if you eat the word of God, you will be fed the true word of God, the true living bread that will bring life to your soul and life to your bones. If you don't eat the word of God, but you eat everything else this world offers you, you will poison yourself. You will be unhealthy spiritually. It is that illustration. But secondly, 
what we eat shapes who we are in community with. So if you have a specific diet, more than likely you're going to hang out with those people. Even if you have a specific taste, you will hang out with specific people based on those tastes. And people will shape your taste depending on who you hang out with. Diet goes hand in hand with your community. The Jews were commanded not to eat certain things. They had the strict law regarding what not to eat and what to eat that no other nation had. And it was all about keeping them separated from the nations around them so that they could be the pure race through whom Jesus would come. So Daniel makes that decision not to eat the king's choice food, to eat water and vegetables, because he wants to make sure that he is in community with God's people. He is also speaking to his spirit about eating the true word and not the falsehoods of the devil. And he is making sure that he reminds himself on a daily basis, you eat three times a day, on a daily basis he is reminding himself that he is not Babylonian, he is Jewish. Now, I am taking a long road around on this question, so I'm sorry. Acts chapter 10, Peter is on the roof in Joppa and the Lord gives him a vision of a sheet being let down from heaven with all the unclean animals and the voice from heaven says, get up, kill Peter and eat. Kill, P Get up, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter says, I haven't ever eaten anything unclean, Lord. And he says, don't call anything unclean that I have made clean. All of that dietary restrictions from the Leviticus law book, even right through Deuter uh, Daniel's life and all the way into Acts, all of that was pointing to that now that the finished work of Jesus has been accomplished for the sins of the world, that the Jews no longer need to restrict themselves from the Gentile people because they have the gospel of Jesus Christ that when preached will make an impact upon the human heart, change that human heart, and unite Gentile and Jew together as one in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female, all are one in Christ Jesus, right? So that law about not eating pork is abolished at the cross. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you. Give me some bacon. Anybody eating bacon out there? Uh, now you can eat that food because that was pointing to what Jesus came to do, bring the food from heaven to the nations. And interestingly enough, as Peter's having that uh, vision in Acts chapter 10, Cornelius, the Gentile Roman centurion, the Italian, Italian, he's getting a vision from God saying, your prayers and your alms have come up as a memorial before God. And by the way, go and send for Peter who is in Joppa. He will come and bring you a message that I want you to hear. Peter comes in and the first thing he says to these Gentiles who are gathered, he says, listen, it's not, it's not appropriate for me to be here according to the word. I'm not supposed to be here. The law says I shouldn't be even in your room, but I'll tell you about Jesus. He died, rose again. And as soon as he starts talking about Jesus, the people, the Holy Spirit falls on the Gentiles. They start speaking in tongues. Cornelius' whole house is baptized and saved, and the, the Gentile ministry begins in Acts chapter 10, all because Jesus uses that illustration, that ancient Levitical law against eating pork and other unclean foods to bring the Gentiles into Christ, to bring the Gentiles into the family of God. Isn't that cool? Now, let's talk about the yarmulke. Uh, the yarmulke is just a tradition. Just like you said, it's a tradition. It's not a law. It's not in the book. It's not in the Old Testament. Uh, it is a tradition based on the Jewish teaching that is in the uh, Talmud, I believe it's in the Talmud, uh, that if a Jewish man is praying, he should keep his head covered to show subordination to God. So that, that tradition comes down all the way to today, and still to this day, the Jewish men wear a yarmulke as a symbol of submission to Yahweh. And so we don't follow that because, uh, first of all, the Bible, even in the New Testament, tells us in 1 Corinthians 11... That if a man prays or prophesies with his head covered, he dishonors his head. Uh, and so that was referring to some cultural traditions in Corinth, but it was also referring to the fact that man is the head of the house or the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the man and God is the head of Christ. So you have this tradition. Like We have to remember that there are some traditions in, our, in every human context that we can, we can kind of get on board with as Christians for the sake of not creating barriers between us and lost people who need to hear the gospel. So sometimes our traditions do that. Sometimes our traditions uh, get in the way of bringing the gospel to others. And uh, the yarmulke is a tradition that, that the Jews practice to speak to their spiritual life before God. Now, let's talk about the last question. Why don't Jewish people believe Jesus died for their sins? They don't believe Jesus died for their sins because their hearts are hardened because the Gentiles came in. People don't realize this. And this is something that many, many Christians 
still don't realize. So I just got done talking about Acts chapter 10 where the Gentiles start coming into Christ. The problem the Jews had, the first century Jews, because Christian, the Christian movement was all Jews for the first 10 to 15 years. People don't even realize that. For the first 10 to 15 years, the whole Christian movement was all Jews. The Jews did not have a problem with Gentiles believing in Jesus. They had a problem with them not becoming Jewish first. In other words, circumcising your children, eating their dietary law restrictions, celebrating the feasts, doing all the things of the Old Testament Levit Levitical law book to become Jewish in order to become Christian. And what Jesus does is he breaks down that, that law. He breaks down that dividing wall, Colossians 2, the dividing wall of hostility. He brings Jew and Gentile together as, as one simply through his finished work at the cross. And Acts chapter 15, the first council of the church, stipulates that there is no way that the Gentiles can follow the Jewish laws first and then become Christians. Because, and then Peter even says, I think it's James actually, who says, we can't even follow these laws. We tried and we stink at it. And we're going to put it on Gentiles who weren't even born Jewish? So then they come up with three laws, and even two of those three laws are no longer appropriate for the church. The, the point is, is that from Acts chapter 10 to Acts chapter 15, is we are learning that people get saved not through the traditions and the laws of the Jewish faith. They get saved through believing in Jesus Christ. Now, they are not saved to do what they want. They are saved now to do what God wants, wherein the Holy Spirit comes into their lives, shapes their hearts, convicts them of sin, transforms them from the inside out, not so that they adhere to ceremonial laws of the Jewish religion, but so that they adhere to the higher laws of heaven that are shaped in their spirit by the work of God. Okay, long question, long answer. Great question. Thank you so much. Okay, over to the chat for a second. Scrambled eggs and hot cocoa from Thassia. Avocado toast. Good for you with a boiled egg, Eliezer. Good choice for lunch. You make me sick. <laughs> it's not my choice. <laughs> Deluxe nugget. I'm allergic to pork and selfish, so I should have been born Jewish. Well, maybe. Or Muslim. <laughs> okay. And hello, Nicole. Welcome, everybody. Love the chat. Keep it up. Let's get into question number four. My question is this. Is it right to take what is said in 1 Peter 2, 19 to 20 to mean that when one suffers unjustly and endures it as an example, is it, is, it is an example of God being gracious? Thanks, Robert. And Robert, actually, that question was much longer. I shortened it. So let's go to 1 Peter 2, 19 on the Bible cam. Whoops. Let's go to 1 Peter 2, 19 on the Bible cam. What does he say? He says... Um, oh, and I think that the problem you have with the text here of Robert is verse 18. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to be, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. So if you have a, sl if you have a, sl a master and you're a servant in the ancient Roman world, okay, and there's a bad ser slave master, a bad owner over you, be subject to them too with all respect, not just to the ones that, that appreciate you and like you. Now, these, this rule, by the way, can now be translated into our context. Remember, I talked about context and cultural concepts, okay? So this can be translated into employment status. So, so in, in 21st century America, employees be subject to your employers, not just to the good ones, but also to the bad ones. For this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure, but if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Then look what he says later. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you may follow in his steps. He committed no sin. Deceit was not found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued to entrust himself to him who judges, judges, judges justly. Okay? So I only say that because I want to bring the whole text into the light of what your question is. Back to your question. Which is... Um, is, it an, is this an example of God being gracious? It is an example of us being gracious. When we suffer with Christ in unjust circumstances and we respect even those who are disrespectful to us and we don't revile and we don't attack when we are attacked, we are a gracious example to the world that this is what the transformed heart of Jesus looks like. 
And I say that because there's a good chance somebody listening to me right now, you're in a job where you are not appreciated, you are not respected, you are not treated nicely, and you have to do what 1 Peter 2, 19 says. Because right now, at least, maybe in your context, in your situation, you can't leave that job. You might have you might have financial constraints. You might have geological constraints. You might have you might have relationship constraints that keep you in that job. And so you have to you have to suffer unjustly. This is not saying, and please don't take this to mean that if your job stinks and you can get out of it, you shouldn't get out of it because suffering in that job is showing the love of Jesus. No. Don't be a doormat. Don't be a fool. Get a new job. If you can get a new job, get a new job. Okay, I've been in jobs that I hated because the boss was a jerk. I got out. You can absolutely do that. Take advantages of the laws and the freedoms that you have in this country to find yourself a good job where you are not mistreated and disrespected on a constant basis. But if you're in a situation where that does not, that, that does not, that's just not possible. You have to be there. You have to keep the job. It pays you too much money. Your family is just getting started. You've got kids to feed, whatever. And you have to suffer unjustly. Well, what it's saying is bear under that suffering and do not repay evil for evil and do not revile and do not curse and do not do the things that people normally naturally do because you are no longer a normal and natural person. You are now a peculiar person, 1 Peter 2, 9, and you are a holy person, Ephesians chapter 1, and you are the salt of the earth and the light of the world, Matthew chapter 5. You are not of this world. And you are a supernatural person. So you have a new way of living in unjust circumstances. And that is a sign to unbelievers that you are different. Anyone, and, and he says this in the text. He says this back in the text, right? Ugh. I'm struggling with the buttons. It's been too long, guys. Okay. He says it back in the text that this is a picture of what Jesus did and God will judge justly. God will judge. So God will take up arms for you at the last day, or maybe even before the last day, in the face of the injustice that you face. So you trust that God is in charge of that process for you. You trust that God will see that unjust treatment and he will judge rightly the person who treats you so badly. Thank you for the question, Robert. I hope that helps. Yes. Uh, let's get into question number five. Moving right along, and we're right, at, we're right at 1230, so good timing. I feel filled with the Holy Spirit and hence tend to live altruistically. Now, altruistically means generously, for those of you who don't know. <laughs> this often includes giving financially to those in need. Can this be considered tithing or is tithing only when you give to the church? Okay, great question. Thank you. First off, I don't think it's considered tithing. And I think a very strong case can be made from the biblical text that tithes come to the church. Okay. Now, <clears throat> what is a tithe? Tithe, the word tithe just means one-tenth. It means tenth. Tithing does not start, listen to me very carefully, does not start with the law. It starts with Mo, um, Abraham. Abraham brings a tenth to Melchizedek after winning the war with the five kings and rescuing Lot out of Sodom and Gomorrah. Melchizedek, the priest of God, comes with bread and wine, picture of Jesus, and, and Abraham gives him a tenth of everything. That's where tithing actually starts. People don't realize this. Actually, you could go back further and say that Abel tithed and Cain didn't because the Bible says that Abel brought the firstborn of his flocks. Cain brought, in the left, Cain brought of the fruit of the ground the leftovers in the course of time. When he had enough, then he gave to God. That's why the Bible says that God looked favorably upon Abel's offering, but on Cain's offering, he did not look favorably. This is what made Cain jealous and made Cain kill Abel. So tithing is right there in the first two brothers. Then it actually is mitigated as a 10% principle under Abraham. It carries down through Abraham to Isaac and to um, Jacob, of all people. Wicked, evil, gnarly Jacob uh, says to God, of everything that you give me, I'll give you a tenth. Then it makes its way into the law. Now, how it makes it its way into the law of Moses is you gave 10% to the temple, the house of worship, 10% to the Levitical priesthood. So that would be your governing system. The t you could call that taxes. And then you gave 10% every th uh, three years to the poor. So 10% plus 
plus 10%, plus about 3.3%, because over a three-year period, you would give 10% of your income to the poor. That's the law regarding giving for the Old Testament. Now, everything in the Old Testament law comes through the cross. And some Old Testament laws are annulled at the cross, like we just talked about. The food laws are annulled at the cross because they were pointing to certain spiritual components of the Jewish religion and the gospel message that were fulfilled in Christ. The feasts stop at the cross. You don't have to celebrate the feast anymore. I know people like to celebrate the Passover. I know you like to. Ce- some people like to celebrate that on uh, around Easter. You don't have to. That stops at the cross. Why? Because Jesus is the final Passover lamb. So anyway, uh, there are many passages that come through, uh, many laws that come to the cross and stop. There are many laws that come through the cross and they stay the same, such as murder. You don't murder. It, the, the gospel does not give you permission to murder. You don't steal. The gospel does not give you permission to steal, right? So many lo- moral laws come through the cross. Then there are some laws that come not just through the cross, but they come up. They are elevated after the cross. So Jesus gives us a couple of examples when he talks about adultery. He says, listen, don't even look lustfully. He says, murder. Don't even look angrily. Don't even call your brother a fool. Th- there's an elevation, even stealing. Actually, that's stealing goes higher in Ephesians 4.28 when it says, now no longer steal, but also work with your hands hard and then have something to share with those in need. So the law goes higher, not just avoiding stealing, but being a hard worker who becomes generous with what God gives you. Does that make sense? Now, you have to ask yourself, if it was 10% to the church, 10% to the government, and 3% to to the poor every single year for God's people in ancient Israel, can you really say that at the cross that stops so now you don't have to give at all? Can you really say that now at the cross that actually just stays the same? No, that, that law goes higher. I believe with all my heart that 10% goes to your local church because your local church brings the gospel to the people that you invite. Hopefully, if you're going to a life-giving gospel preaching church, if you're going to an old-fashioned church that doesn't care about the loss, stop going. But if you're going to a church where people love Jesus and love bringing Jesus to lost people, give, tithe. Number one, it supports the mission of Jesus in your local community. Number two, it supports the person who is feeding you spiritually. And Paul talks about this in Corinthians. He says, if I sow spiritual seed among you, isn't it right for me to reap material fruit from you? In other words, you should be tending to my material needs so that I, because I have tended to your spiritual needs. In 1 Timothy 4, he talks about that the elders who teach should be are worthy of double honor. The word honor, timon in Greek, could often refer to uh, financial honor. So you pay your preacher. Uh, Galatians chapter 6, that, that when you receive, you give to the preacher who, gives, who feeds your soul. The tithes empower all of that. Now, I always get frustrated with Christians who don't tithe, but they gladly pay their, well, they don't gladly pay their taxes, but they rudimentarily pay their taxes. They gladly pay for their clothing. They gladly pay for their cable TV. They gladly pay for their internet access. When those are channels that flood immorality into your home, but the channel that is responsible for bringing the gospel to your home, you don't give to? Are you serious? You do understand that God is going to hold you accountable for how you spent his money. You do understand that if you paid for cable and you paid for internet access and you paid for these phones that are, I think, about $1,000 each now, and you didn't give to God, you're accountable to that. That's a scary place to be. I think you should put God first financially. I think you should tithe. Tithe is is the training wheels of giving. It's the training wheels of giving so that you learn to live altruistically like you're talking about. And I thoroughly encourage you to try at least to live up to that principle of 3% a year to the poor. Are you giving to the poor? Are you sponsoring children with Compassion International, one of my favorite ways to give to the poor? Are you giving beyond your tithes to those who are in need? And don't think that if you're supporting a child, (laughs) oh man, I've gotten this I've gotten this from Christians. Well, I use my tithe to support my child who doesn't go to church. Are you flipping kidding me? You don't support your child who doesn't believe in Jesus with the money that belongs to God. They just, why don't you just send them to hell? Why don't you just send them to hell immediately? Because you are enabling them to live in disobedience to God by giving God's money to them. I'm not saying that this is what the questioner is doing. I'm just warning those of you who do. Let's just be honest. Let me just be honest for a second. People are cheap toward God. People, especially in America, do you know that we had a higher percentage of giving to the church under the Great Depression than we do right now to the church? 
people in the Great Depression were giving about 4% to the church in the Great Depression. Today, they give about 2.2%. And I'm talking about Christians. That's disgusting. We can afford $1,000 phones. We can afford all kinds of subscription services to all kinds of things. Hey, fund the mission of Jesus. Fund the word of God. Getting into your heart, getting into your family, getting into your children. Man, come on. I get fired up about this. I do not approve at all of you taking what belongs to God and giving it to anyone else. And you can say all that you want about, well, the church is not a building. and all. That. No, the church needs a building because we can't gather in your home unless you're willing to open up your home to a thousand people. We can't gather there. Okay? It's nice to have a place where we can all go, right? <laughs> By the way, the government of the United States sets it up for you to tithe and make more money doing it. Do you realize this? The government of the United States says if you tithe, we will let you take that off of your income and tax you less. <laughs> this is why I tithe before I get taxed. I tithe on my gross, not my net. Because at the end of the year, April 15th comes around and I say to the government, you can stick it with 10% of what I made. Because I gave that to God and it doesn't belong to you. And then the government of the United States says, okay, so you made 10% less than you actually made. And now we will tax you on that. Do you realize how blessed we are in America to have these opportunities? Uh, so you fund the church with your tithes, you give faithfully, and I believe God gives back to you a hundredfold, a hundredfold. And I'm going to tell you one more thing, and it's going to hurt. If you don't tithe, you lose it. If you don't give God the first, you will lose it through other channels and other means, and God will lift up his hand of protection off of you, and you will lose it through bad investments, through horrible life choices, through uh, debilitating issues that are financially strangleholds on your life. Where do I get that idea? I get that from Exodus 15. The Bible says that they were to take and, and redeem the lambs, and they were to redeem the donkeys with a, with a lamb. So if you got a donkey, if a donkey was born into your farm under ancient Israel, you redeemed it by sacrificing a lamb, saying, God, you gave me this donkey. I, I need the donkey for work, so I'm going to sacrifice this lamb, which doesn't work. I'm going to give that to you. Okay? And then there's this stipulation. If you don't redeem the donkey, break its leg. Why? It's a pitcher, friend. It's a pitcher that if you don't redeem it, if you don't give it to God, you will lose it. You will lose it. There are so many Christians that are strapped financially. Do you know why? Because you don't redeem that donkey. You don't redeem your work. You don't redeem your income. You don't redeem your what, what God blesses you with. You don't see it as God's. You see it as yours. And this is why you are always strapped for cash. Tithe. Give to God first. I guarantee you. Malachi chapter 4. He will throw, three, he will throw open the doors of heaven and he will pour out such a blessing upon you that you cannot contain it. And then he even says, and I will rebuke the devourer for you. If you bring your tithes to the house of God, I will rebuke the devourer for you. In other words, the things that are devouring your money right now, the broken donkey legs, I'm going to stop that the moment you give to God first. Thank you for the question. <laughs> okay. Oh, by the way, don't tithe to this channel. Don't tithe to, you tithe to your local church and you tithe to gospel preaching churches, period, period. Don't you dare. Oh, I hate this too. You know, I got people that come to my church. We preach the gospel. We see get people getting saved, baptized all the time. And then they give to their dead church across the street or down the street or the next town over. Are you kidding me? Look, if you get fed at McDonald's, you pay McDonald's. If you get fed at Burger King, you pay Burger King. Okay. If you buy food at Whole Foods, you don't pay Burger King for Whole Foods. Whole Foods got good food. Burger King's got crap food. But this is what we do with, the, with, with money all the time, with God's money. With God's money, we do this. And let me just say, honestly, this is why the gospel mission is, is so anemic in this country. Because we've got tons of churches that are getting supported by people who don't preach the gospel. And the ones that are preaching the gospel, money that should be coming into those churches are going to the churches that don't preach the gospel. And then we wonder why our culture is so utterly corrupt. Listen, I'm, I'm telling you, 
We could change this culture. We could turn this culture around for the gospel of Jesus Christ. If God's people got on board with gospel preaching churches and gave and supported them so that they could do it without financial stresses, so they could do it without financial burdens, and they could be generous with the gospel to get the message out. My church, I'm only speaking for my church. My church exists for one reason, to bring people who are far from God close to God. And if you give to our church, number one, we give 10% of whatever you give away. So we're already tithing. And number two, we will take that 90% and we will fund the mission of Jesus. I have no interest in getting rich. I have no interest in retiring early. I am going to do this until the day I die. You support our church. It's going to go into the gospel and bring lost people to heaven. Period. Thank you for the question. Uh, question number six. When Jesus came to the disciples after he defeated death, he gave them the great commission before ascending into heaven to go and proclaim the gospel to all the world, saying that some people would believe and be baptized and others would not believe and be condemned. He then said that signs would follow them that believe, and they are casting out demons, speaking in new tongues, uh, deadly serpents and poisons would not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Is this something that all believers are commissioned to do? Why is the church divided on this? And the question goes on. It was actually a very long question. Let me see if I can get to the rest of it. There are very, very few churches that have healing and ministry, uh, deliverance ministries. The ones who do, their methods are different. Only two that are within a two-hour distance of me. He goes on about this. Hold on. Uh, this is their deliverance ministry. They take people privately into rooms and talk about their past. They lead them in prayers to break legal rights of demons by one, repenting of sins, forgiving of sins against, against self and others, breaking curses from sins of ancestors. Once that is done, they cast out the attached demons of that sin slash trauma. Depending on how demonized a person is, it can be a long process of coming out off in layers. Regarding healing, we were told not simply to pray for the sick, but to heal the sick. Okay. Okay, let me sum this up. Mark 16. And uh, I can actually bring us... I'm going to do this right for once. Here we go. The Bible camp. There we go. Mark 16 is the passage you were talking about. And uh, he talks about this, the signs and wonders in the part, the part of Mark 16 that says, right before it says, some early manuscripts don't include Mark 16, 9 to 20. Great debate about these verses, whether or not they are inspired or not. And that's where he talks about it here in that chat, in that section where he says, whoever believes verse 16, and then he goes, those signs will accompany, believe uh, they will um, cast out demons, speak new tongues, pick up serpents, drink deadly poison. It won't hurt. Yada, 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 on and on and on. Okay. First off, let me just say all these signs are fulfilled in the book of Acts, except for de uh, drinking deadly poison. All these signs um, are fulfilled in the book of Acts, including... When Paul at the island of Malta um, picks up sticks to throw in the fire and a serpent bites him and then he shakes it off and they say, oh my gosh, he didn't die. And, he, and then they consider Paul a god. That's at the end of the, of, of the book of Acts. So they do cast out demons. They do speak in new tongues and they do uh, pick up serpents with their hands. And that's the only one that's not in the book of Acts. And they lay hands on the sick and the sick recover. Okay, so... All that to say this, we don't have to be divided about what the book of Acts clearly demonstrates as the signs of those who believe. We don't have to be divided about that at all because it's all over the book of Acts. Uh, by the way, I speak in tongues. Um, in our church, we have seen people have demons cast out of them. Uh, now, this text in Mark 16 is not telling us to go and put God to the test and drink deadly poison and pick up serpents. That's not what it's saying. What it's talking about is you're going to have a general protective work of God in your life as you bring the gospel to the nations. God is going to not just provide, he's going to protect. He's not, by the way, back to tithing. God is going to provide. Even if people don't tithe my church, God provides. He provides in ways I can't tell you, so many ways. So the issue of tithing is not, oh my gosh, the church is hard up, please help us. The issue, the issue of tithing is your heart. So anyway, in the message of the gospel being brought to the nations, know this, that Jesus says, you're going to be protected from these deadly attacks to get my job done. Now, pastor, I have heard and I've seen Christians get killed, thrown to lions. Even in Nigeria, they're shot. In Muslim countries, they're, they're terribly treated and put to death for the gospel. Yes, they are. And the scripture says, precious is in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. You understand that we see death from the ground up. God sees death from heaven down. And, and death 
heaven down is God saying, I'm going to actually bring you home. I'm going to bring you home to be with me and your pains will be over. Back to the question though. Casting out demons still happens today. Speaking in new tongues still happens today. Protective uh, guidance by God in delivering the gospel still happens today. Laying hands on the sick, you're absolutely right. We lay hands on the sick and they recover. Sometimes the recovery is long. Sometimes it's short. Sometimes it's an immediate healing. I have seen all three. I have seen long recovery. I've seen short recovery. I've seen, I've seen spot on recovery. Uh, and it is absolutely something that all commission, all believers are commissioned to do. Yes. Because in the Bible, you know, these people that say that only the apostles should have done this. You don't read the Bible. You don't read the Bible. Go to Acts chapter eight. Philip, who was waiting on tables in Acts chapter seven, he was literally a table waiter. He goes to Samaria, preaches the gospel, casts out sick, heals, heals, heals lame people, signs and wonders at the hands of Philip are being performed. He, he's not an apostle. It wasn't the Philip that hung with Jesus. This was Philip, the guy who was chosen to wait on tables. And he does signs and wonders. The, the point is, signs and wonders should be taking place beyond the apostles because the gospel needs signs and wonders. When the gospel makes inroads into new ground, signs and wonders are very evident many times in the beginning of that gospel mission. Now, let me unpack a biblical principle for you because everybody wants signs and wonders in every church all the time. That doesn't happen. God ordered the universe and the world to operate according to laws that he has already designed so that if they operate according to these laws, if we follow the natural laws, if we follow the spiritual laws of God, things should go pretty well for us. There's a lot of cancer in our country right now. And the reason why there's a lot of cancer in our country is because we eat like crap and we don't exercise. If we follow just the natural law of eating right and exercising, there'd be a lot less cancer. If we didn't smoke, there'd be a lot less cancer. Got it? So the point is that sometimes we want those immediate signs and wonders. And yes, Throughout human history, throughout the Christian history, there have been signs and wonders, dead people rising, lamb, limbs being grown back. I have heard reports of this from the mission field. When the gospel needs to make inroads into a new unreached people group, signs and wonders usually accompany whoever goes into that unreached people group. There are testimonies of this down through the, the annals of church history where this has happened. We haven't seen it all. Acts records it as a prototype of what we can expect going forward with the gospel into the nations. Now, this is how God has operated according to the scriptural narrative of history from, from Genesis. Remember, how did the Israelites get out of Egypt? Through signs and wonders. But once they get out of, the, out of Egypt, the signs and wonders are, are no longer spectacular. Now they get just daily bread and they get um, water from the rock. And then even those signs stop after they get into the promised land, because God was saying, okay, now you're going to cultivate the earth and you're going to follow the laws and the land and you're going to treat it right and you're going to treat each other right and everything's going to go well for you. And the signs and the wonders actually stop. Whenever God starts to do a new work, whenever God starts to do a new, you know, groundbreaking work in human history, huge signs and wonders follow that. Huge signs and wonders accomplish, accompany that so that the, the, uh, the credence of God's word is evidenced through the, the the miraculous workings of God. It lends credence. And I have heard reports of this throughout the mission field. Hundreds and hundreds of times. I have. I I, I know of many examples, and I could give them to you. Ag, uh, Angus Buckham, he is a farmer. He is a farmer in South Africa. And the farmers in so South Africa right now, they are getting... They are getting beaten, tortured. They are getting their lands confiscated by the government. It's all kinds of nonsense going on down there. And this guy started a ministry for men, but he was saved radically. And he has seen people healed miraculously. He has laid hands on dead people. They have risen to life again. This, this farmer, this guy out of nowhere, no seminary, no Bible college, signs and wonders as God made a new inroad of his work into that community. There's a great movie on that called uh, Faith Like Potatoes. You should watch that movie and get the accompanying documentary. I think his name is Agnes. Agnes Bacham. 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 <laughs> that movie will change your life. Faith Like Potatoes, but rather watch the accompanying documentary. Thank you for the question. Number seven. Number seven. And I got to get going quick because we are running out of time. Concerning Revelation 21, 12 and Revelation 22, 15, why would angels be guarding the 12 gates of the new Jerusalem? Is it because the unredeemed will be around at that time? I've searched in the Bible and study helps and it's difficult for me finding answers to those questions. What are your views on this? Sincerely, Diane O. Uh, thank you, Diane, for the question. And my answer to you is simply this. There are angels at the gates, but it doesn't say they're guarding the gates. It says they're just there. 
And yes, unredeemed are outside, according to Revelation chapter 22, verse 15. The sorcerers, the wicked, the immoral, you know, all those, all those, that, that, that great list. In fact, let me bring it up on my Bible text, my uh, Bible app here, that text, just so we can read it clearly here. Verse 15. Outside are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexual immoral, the murderers, idolaters, everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Yes, they're outside the heavenly city, uh, which shows you not so much uh, where is hell as much as it shows you that heaven is uncontaminated by all those things. That's what heaven is. So if you enjoy sorcery, if you enjoy sexual immorality, if you enjoy murder and idolatry and falsehood, then heaven's not for you. So the angels, I wouldn't say they are guarding the gates. There's no way unbelievers or the immoral can get into the gates of heaven. This is a picture of the kingdom to come. The kingdom to come is freed from sin, the presence of sin. At the cross, we were freed from the power of sin. Through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, we were freed from the, um, I'm sorry, at the cross, we were freed from the penalty of sin, penalty of sin. Through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, after salvation, we are freed from the power of sin, and that is progressive. So we sin less and less the longer we are in Christ. And then ultimately, at the return of Christ in the new, in the new age that dawns uh, in, in the redeemed, we are freed from the presence of sin. So the angels are not necessarily guarding the gates. They are just standing at the gates. Nobody's getting in. Hope that uh, answers the question. I, I'm sorry, Diane, I have to go quickly now because I'm running out of time. And I want to make sure that we stay an hour. Question number eight. I have a question about pride. Since pride is a sin, is it sinful to be proud of someone else? I've been wondering because I know pride is more selfish and about giving yourself the credit instead of God. So if you're proud of someone else, is that being prideful, selfish, taking God's credit away? No, not at all. Uh, pride, understand, is the sin of self-love at the expense of God and others. And this is the sin of Satan. This is the sin of Lucifer. He, ex he exalted himself. He worshiped himself. He wanted to put himself in the place of God. That's what the sin of pride is. Pride is not enjoying the contributions or achievements of someone in your life, including your own. You could be proud of the degree that you earned. You could be proud of the job that you're doing. You could be, in fact, is not God proud of his work in creation when he creates one day and then he looks back and he sees it and he says, it is good. You could say in a sense that God is taking pride in his creation. He's taking pride in his work. In Ecclesiastes, it talks about this. There is nothing better under the sun than that one should uh, do his work well and enjoy it, right? There is a problem when that's all we do, when it's all about ourselves, when we're only working so that we can make a name for ourselves. Tower of Babel mindset. Uh, the, rich, the, uh, the, the, the man whose crop produced greatly in one season in Luke chapter 12, I think. And he says, what will I do? I got all this money. What will I do? I know what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns. I'll big bigger ones. And I'll pour all those crops into the bigger barns. And I'll sit back and I'll say, eat, drink, and be merry. And God says, you fool. Tonight, your soul is required of you. Now who's going to get what you have provided for yourself? That's pride. Pride is when you think only of yourself at the expense of God and everyone else around you. So no, you can be proud of your kids. You can be, it, 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 Paul is proud of Timothy. He's proud of Epaphroditus. He tells, he tells the church in Philippi, I have no one else like, like Timothy. He is my true son. He is fantastic. He serves generously and selflessly. So he actually had pride in Timothy, pride in Epaphroditus, his fellow workers in the Lord. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. So thank you for your question. Question number nine. In the book of Genesis, how do dinosaurs align with God's creation over the first seven days? Science tells us man came long after dinosaurs, but Moses said man was created on the sixth day. If possible, could you provide a timeline? Okay. I love that last part. Can I provide a timeline? Yeah, I can provide. I can absolutely provide a timeline. I can take you right over here to the Bible cam and I can go over here to Genesis chapter one. And I want to give you a little text. I want to show you a little text right here. Verse 20 of Genesis 1, God said, let the water swarm with uh, swarms of living creatures and birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens and then skip down to 24. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kind. So let the earth bring forth living creatures, livestock, creeping things, beasts of the earth, beasts. You can include dinosaurs there according to their kind. So the timeline is 
Uh, that on this, by the way, this is the sixth day, I believe. Yes, this is all in the sixth day. Because that's the fourth day. Sorry, the birds of the heavens. Just doing this as I... The birds and, yes, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea are the fifth day. And then the beasts of the field, the livestock and the creeping things are the sixth day, which is also the day that God makes man. So there's your timeline. Here's the principle. Can you say that these are 24-hour days? Now, you have to ask yourself that question. Everybody has to answer that question. Is the narrative of Genesis 1 telling us that in six literal 24-hour days, God made the heavens and the earth and everything that we know and see? I submit to you that they are not. And the reason why I submit to you that they are not is because you don't even have the moon or the sun until the third day. (laughs) Back to the Bible camp, right? So... This uh, third day, no, 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 hold on. Let me just see. Let me, let me get my, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The first day. So the first day you have light and darkness the first day. And then on the th- fourth day, you have lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. Got it? That is on... What day is that? That is day four. So you have light and darkness on day one, but you don't have the sun and moon until day four. How can you have a 24-hour day without a sun and moon? That's my point. That's what I'm, oops, sorry. That's what I'm telling you. And in day six, we don't know how long that day was. Even English speakers speak of day as a period of time because we say, oh, way back in my day. Well, when they say my day, they're not talking about a specific day. They're talking about a range of time. All right. Now, you have every right to disagree with me about this. And I don't care. You can disagree with me about it. It is very possible that God made the heavens and the earth and everything that we see in six 24-hour days. By all means, believe that if you want. And he absolutely could have done that. I don't tend to believe that. I also don't, and I don't, I don't believe it because there's a gap if you look at this text here again, let's go here. There we go. Between day, uh, between verse one and verse two. In the beginning, verse one, God created the heavens and the earth. And then verse two, the earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep and the spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. How long is that verse two? We don't know. This is not a day. This does not say one day. He made the heavens and the earth, formless and void. And then he starts to create. He starts to, f- he starts to fabricate on day one of creation. So now we have a follow-up question in the chat, and I'm glad. Thank you for the follow-up in the question in the chat. Did the dinosaurs die during the flood? Very, very possible. Very, very possible. The dinosaur uh, remains, too, are typically found uh, up in Montana and some of the other parts of the earth that were not areas of the earth that man inhabited in the early days of human history. So it's very possible that God ordered those man-killing animals, dinosaurs, in the parts where mankind would not be found and that at the flood, he destroyed all those animals. It's very possible. The point is that Genesis chapter one is not teaching us to believe in a six 24 hour day period. The Genesis chapter one is teaching us that God is God. Our God is God over all the things that may other people worship as God. So other people worship the birds, you know, other people groups. Other people groups worship the animals. Other people, like Pharaoh, worship the cow. India, still, they, they deify the cow. Um, other nations, Native Americans in this country worship the trees, worship certain grounds, certain you know, places of land. And what Genesis 1 is teaching God's people is, I am the creator of all those things that everybody else worships. And there's a spiritual principle there to trust him and not those things for your provision. Okay, I hope that helps. Question number 10. And finally. Pastor talked about, this is on Sunday, Pastor talked about how when Jesus returns, our bodies will be glorified and we will rise from the grave in our eternal state. But what about people who are cremated? They don't have a grave to come out of and they technically don't have remains. They are just ash. Does that mean as believers, we shouldn't be cremated? Well, there's a whole bunch of Christians who don't believe we should be cremated. I will confess to you that based on the, the idea of the resurrected body. My, gra- my grandfather believed that He's, he pled with his daughters, please don't have me cremated because I want to rise from the dead. Okay. The problem is, 
A lot of Christians were fed to lions in the first century. A lot of Christians were beheaded. A lot of Christians were burned at the stake. Bible-believing Christians who brought the Bible to the common man. They were burned at the stake. In fact, one of them, I think it was John Wycliffe, they so hated him that they not only buried him, they dug him up, and then they burned him, and then they threw him into the river. (laughs) So, you know, uh, the question of whether or not you should be cremated, I don't believe there is a biblical text that says, and I know know there's no biblical text that prohibits cremation. The the point that I want to draw your attention to is that God— clearly talks about this through through the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, where what is so naturally is completely different than what is what is reaped supernaturally in terms of the resurrection. Our bodies are sown in uh, dishonor. They are raised in glory. And Paul says, when you put a seed in the ground, what comes out of the ground looks nothing like the seed. So don't get caught up on what goes into the ground or where it goes into the ground. Because God is going to supernaturally transform that into a resurrected body that will be glorif- glorious, just like His resurrected body. And for those of you who work, for those of who, for those of not you, for those who were cremated, did not God create the first man out of the dust of the earth? Did He not whip it together with His hands and squeeze it together and poof, blow the breath of life into it? Well, He can do it again. He just has that ability. So I wouldn't worry about that. If you know somebody who loved Jesus but was cremated, God can find those ashes and. Stitch them back together with the breath of his mouth. Amen. Should you get cremated? I don't think that there's a law against that. Okay. Uh, there are some people who get cremated because they're afraid of waking up in their coffin. <laughs> and uh, you don't have to worry about that anymore with modern techniques of burial. I mean, your blood is gone when you get buried nowadays. So there's no way of waking up. Let's go to the chat one last time. Thanks, guys, for tuning in today. So glad that you were all here. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, love that illustration about the laws coming to an end. Yeah, oh, thank you, Jared. Hi, Jared. Didn't know that. I need to tithe more, Kelly. Oh, ouch. Thank you for the correction. Yes, you're welcome. I've wondered about healing. Francis Chan got so much criticism when he said people were healed. Well, you know, that's the thing. I, I really, I can't stand people who want to criticize healing. It's just like the Pharisees. The Pharisees saw people get healed and they're like, oh, you should do that on the Sabbath. And Jesus is like, what the? Ah, you know, I, I really do hate that. We should be rejoicing over healing. Somebody watched Faith Like Potatoes. Mm. The way I die doesn't determine where I'm going. That's right. What you believe determines where you're going. Well, thank you guys so much for being here. I'm so glad that you were here. Uh, this was a this was a good ten questions. Uh, it happens on the first of the month uh, every month, and uh, I hope that you will tune in Tuesday night. The deep end is back. Follow on the social media channels if you would, and be with us once again Tuesday night, seven thirty. I'll see you there. God bless you guys. Take care.